So what is Nourishing Traditions all about? This book by Sally Fallon that I'm always talking about and referencing and discussing traditional foods and nutrient-dense foods. Well, today in the News from Mary's Nest, we're going to talk all about this. Sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, sourdough, ferments, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. When I was growing up, I was raised on a diet of traditional foods. My mother never wasted anything and made the most of everything she had in her kitchen. So we were always enjoying bone broth and eating sourdough breads and so on and so forth. And then as an adult, you know, you get busy and you're working and I was single and I kind of fell away from that. I wasn't necessarily rushing out to make bone broth in my kitchen or make sourdough and these various things that sometimes can be perceived as a little time consuming. And it wasn't until I got married and became a mother that I stumbled across this book, Nourishing Traditions, which was published, I believe, 1998, 1999. I think a second edition might have come out in 1999. But in any event, it reaffirmed everything that I knew growing up. It reaffirmed that all the foods that I was raised on were very nutritious and very good for us and good for overall health. And so I dove back into all of this, making these foods in my kitchen because I wanted to feed my family that way and especially raise my son on the foods that I had been raised on. Now this book, Nourishing Traditions, uh, which is authored by Sally Fallon and uh, also uh, her co-author with her was uh, Mary Ennig, who had a PhD. Um, but what was interesting about this is when I started reading and learning about Sally, she was a mother, she had four children, and she wanted to make sure that she fed her family uh, nutritious food. Uh, the types of foods, traditional foods, that people were eating for thousands of years before uh, all of the commercial food that came into our food system. And in a previous video, which I'll link to in the iCards and in the description below, I talk about, uh, you know, what are traditional foods? And just to do a quick summary, basically they're real foods prepared in traditional ways, in the ways that different cultures, depending on what real foods they had, uh, depending on what part of the world they lived in, uh, and then how they took those real foods and prepared them in traditional ways to make sure that they extracted every last little bit of nutrients from the foods that they had. So in the end, what exactly are traditional foods? They're real foods that are prepared in a traditional way in order to extract as much nutrition out of them as possible. But what started Sally on this journey and writing this book requires us to go back in time, long before the 1990s. In her search for wanting to learn about traditional foods and their proper preparation, she discovered some research by actually, of all people, a dentist. And the book that she discovered was Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by Dr. Weston A. Price. And if you're familiar with the book Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon, the name Weston A. Price probably rings a bell with you because Sally went on to form the Weston A. Price Foundation, which is a foundation that produces a journal and has conferences and so on and so forth to spread the information about traditional foods and their proper pre preparation. And if you've not had a chance to read this book, it's absolutely fascinating. Basically, what Dr. Price has done in this book is chronicle his journeys going back to the 1920s, and maybe the 1930s too, uh, where he and his wife traveled around the world and visited different cultures. And they liked to travel and they found it very interesting. And what they discovered in their travels was that when they would meet people who were living in a very traditional culture with real foods and preparing them in traditional ways, what he found was that they had magnificent teeth. And not only did they have terrific teeth, no cavities, nothing like that, beautifully straight and strong, they had wonderful 
bone structure. He found that they had wide jaws, never a need you know, for braces or anything like that. They had wide jaws and beautifully uh, set apart eyes and lovely no, uh, bone structure of their nose, that they just had beautiful bone structure and also wonderful physiques. Not only were their faces beautifully proportioned and their teeth strong and healthy, their bodies were strong and healthy. They had wonderful uh, proportioned bodies and that were strong and muscular and healthy. And he compared all of this to the people that he was used to seeing in his dental office who often had crooked teeth and not well-formed uh, faces and weaker physiques. And he wondered why. And something that he discovered in his travels, that sometimes in these traditional cultures, he might meet people whose teeth didn't look very well and maybe didn't have the best uh, physiques and facial structure. And he said to them, have you been in this village all your life? And interestingly enough, they would share that they had gone to live in the city, or whatever city might have been near their village and whatnot, and eaten a different diet than they ate growing up or living, whatever the case may be, in their village. So what was the difference? What were they eating in their village? And what were they eating when they would go into the city? And what were his patients who lived in the city life? What were they eating? And the difference boiled down to a traditional diet versus a commercial diet. The traditional people living their traditional culture, eating their traditionally prepared foods, were eating real whole foods that had been properly prepared. Uh, butter uh, from grass-fed cows that were milked in the spring and the butter was made from that milk and it was very yellow. They were eating sourdough breads and they were eating bone broths and they were eating meats from animals that were out in pasture versus the commercial diets of the city people or the people who had went to live into the cities who were eating more commercially prepared foods that were becoming more common in small grocery stores and whatnot. And interestingly enough, their diets were a lot higher in, or almost completely higher in white sugar versus the traditional cultures who didn't eat much sweets, but if they did, they were eating more natural sweeteners like honey or molasses and things like that. But then again, in very small amounts versus the city people who were eating more sweets, larger amounts and made with white sugar. And today we hear so much about how eating too much sugar can really be bad for our health. And especially when we eat white sugar that's stripped of all its nutrients versus just dried cane juice that contains all the nutrients. So Dr. Price found that the healthiest people were the ones who were living in these smaller towns and villages and hadn't been modernized and were still eating real food prepared in their traditional ways, extracting all of the nutrients out of them, and developing healthy babies, healthy young people, healthy adults, so on and so forth, versus the people who were, eat were more modernized in the cities and eating a more modern diet, one that was more commercially prepared foods, were not as healthy. So when Sally wrote her book, Nourishing Traditions, what she did was look at all of these different cultures and how they were preparing their foods in traditional ways, preparing their real foods in traditional ways. And that's what she shares here in this book. And although this, and I love the subtitle because I think it's adorable, the cookbook that challenges politically correct nutrition and the diet dictocrats. <laughs> uh, but this is so much more than a cookbook. It has a lengthy introduction that goes into reviewing a lot of Dr. Price's research and talks about all of the different uh, traditional food groups. It talks about your bone broths. It talks about your cultured dairy. It talks about your ferments. It talks about souring and uh, sprouting, making sourdough breads, making sprouted breads, and so on and so forth. And she covers the whole gamut. 
And so it's a very detailed introduction. The introduction alone is well worth the price of the book because it's so detailed and goes into so, so much wonderful, uh, inf- provides so much wonderful information about traditional foods and their proper preparation. And if you were raised by a mom like me, it really reaffirms everything that uh, the ways your mother may have cooked or your grandmother. And it, it makes you feel very happy to go back to these traditional food preparations because you know that in the long run, uh, that it's going to make you healthier and make your children healthier and your families healthier. And then also you can give some delight to your mother or grandmother by telling them, you know, you were always right. (laughs) So my copy is well worn. I've got a lot of food stains on the side here. I've got a lot of bookmarks uh, with recipes that I enjoy making. And I've really gotten a very good use out of this over uh, the last 20 years. And I highly recommend it if you're interested in traditional foods and bringing, uh, creating a traditional foods kitchen and uh, bringing traditional foods into your kitchen and their proper preparation. You really can't go wrong. There are so many more books on the market now that have been published over the last 20 years but uh, which are fun to have uh, if you stumble across them for new interesting recipes, whatever the case may be. Uh, But this is really the best place to start. And uh, I'll put a link in the description below. You can find this on Amazon, but also look in your local used bookstores. The fact that it's been out such a long time, uh, I often see used copies that are in excellent condition at my local used bookstore. So keep your eyes open for that. So I know you might be saying, well, this is interesting. Is Dr. Price the only person, a dentist, who made these discoveries and came across this? And the truth of the matter is there's actually a lot of people out there uh, from this era who were doing studies on this and looking into this and researching it and trying to understand why the people in the villages, in the small towns, in the traditional cultures, were seemed to be doing so much better than the people that were living in the cities. And there were all kinds of theories and whatnot, obviously living in closer quarters with less fresh air and sunshine, sanitation maybe not being perfect, and so on and so forth. So there were a lot of things. But there is another person who was doing research somewhat similar uh, to, or, or the research was different, but the results were somewhat similar to what Dr. Price was uh, discovering, and that was a Dr. Pottinger. And there's a wonderful uh, inf- one, there's wonderful information to read about Dr. Pottinger, and you may hear it referred to as the cat studies, <laughs> because what Dr. Pottinger did was feed cats a low, f- uh, I believe it's like a low fat, what we would today call a low fat diet. I think they were feeding the the Dr. Pottinger and the researchers were feeding the cats like skim milk and whatnot, and finding that the cats didn't do well, and even more seriously, that their kittens that were born were often born with various um, problems. And so Dr. Pottinger found that there was importance uh, to a high fat diet of good quality high fats. And that's what Dr. Uh, Price discovered also, that these traditional cultures that he visited often relied uh, for a primary source of their diet of a good quality high fat and a saturated fat, like he found in the Swiss villages the uh, Swiss people were eating butter from, as I mentioned earlier, grass-fed cows, and they would eat the green grass that was growing lusciously in the spring, and then they would milk these cows, and the cream would be very yellow, and the butter would be very yellow, very rich in, guess what? Omega-3s, and we hear so much about omega-3s today and how they're good for our health. And other cultures were relying on lard. Other cultures were relying on coconut oil. But all these wonderfully rich, saturated fats. And so the theory was that this was creating good uh, bone structure and good teeth and good, strong, healthy bodies. And Dr. Pottinger seemed to discover 
the same thing, that providing the feeding these cats a commercialized or poor diet compared to feeding them a good, a healthy traditional diet made them healthier and made their offspring healthier, which was fascinating. And uh, you can read a lot about it. A book that I like is called The Pottinger's Prophecy. And this is written by a number of people, uh, Gray Graham, Deborah Keston, and Larry uh, Sherwitz. And I'll put a link uh, below in the description. But this talks all about the research and what Dr. Pottinger and the researchers discovered uh, about, again, eating real foods prepared, the traditional foods prepared in a traditional manner, and how important it was to good health. And now, a lot of this is from many years ago, uh, the, this research. And you may be wondering, well, how does this apply to real life, does, in real modern day life? You know, how can we uh, create this type of environment in our home kitchens to be able to prepare these foods in you know, busy working lives and, and what is a, a good system to get going so that you're uh, soaking your oatmeal and making your bone broth and culturing your dairy. And certainly nourishing traditions can help a lot with that. But once you do all of that, what are the changes that you might expect to see in your own personal health, in your family's health, your children's health, you know, so on and so forth. And there's a wonderful book that I want to share with you. And I actually have two copies because this was written by Richard Morris and it's called A Life Unburdened. And he came out with uh, one book. I don't know if it was the first one was self-published or not. I don't remember. Uh, but uh, later on, another uh, publisher uh, printed the book because I think it was so popular. And Richard Morris is an amazing example of what can happen to you and how you can dramatically change your health uh, when you uh, institute traditional food practices in your kitchen and begin eating traditional foods that are properly prepared and how it can dramatically change your life. Richard was extremely overweight and he was struggling tremendously. He was working though, but he was very uncomfortable. And his wife also was struggling with weight. And one day he tells, I won't give too much of the story away. Oh, speaking of bone broth, <laughs> I'm browning my bones. I'm getting ready to make bone broth. Well, I just tended to my bones. <laughs> Uh, in any event, getting back to Richard. So he was very overweight and uncomfortable and his wife was struggling as well with a, with a weight problem. And he was on a business trip and he didn't really know what to get to eat. I forget the exact details, but he wound up just having some chicken and I think maybe some green beans or something like that tossed in butter. And that was it. And he enjoyed that. And then he found that he felt quite good. It was just a simple meal and he didn't have any processed food or commercially prepared foods, just the chicken. And, uh, and he enjoyed the skin and enjoyed the butter maybe that the beans were uh, floating in and he, he felt very good. And he was talking to his wife and sorry, I don't know if my microphone is picking up my, I have my oven open now, my bones are just sitting on the roasting pan sizzling a bit. But he talked to his wife over the phone and he said, you know, I had some roast chicken and some beans and some butter and I feel really good. I didn't take any uh, commercially prepared food, any, you know, processed foods. And she said, I can't believe you're saying this. And I think maybe her sister was visiting or she was talking with her sister, I can't remember. And they were reminiscing about how their mother cooked and how she would just make a roast chicken and have the vegetables, you know, uh, dotted with butter and whatever the case may be, and how they really missed that home cooking. Well, this started uh, getting the wheels in motion. When Richard got home from his business trip, they decided to cook, uh, do more home cooking. 
and in wanting to do more home cooking, I think that's when they may have discovered nourishing traditions and really wanting to get back to not just home cooking, but traditional home cooking, having a traditional foods kitchen and making these traditional foods and preparing them in a traditional manner. Well, they started on this path and then they started exercising and started walking and doing various things. And I have to tell you, you have got to read this book because it is so heartfelt. It is so beautifully written about how he talks about losing a massive amount of weight. And his wife was not as heavy as him, but she also lost weight. But he talks about how traditional foods so significantly changed his life, eating traditional foods and how it so significantly changed his life and how cooking uh, these foods and creating this kitchen, uh, this traditional foods kitchen, cr home cooking, walking, walking with his wife and talking with his wife, how it not only changed them individually, physically, it also changed them mentally. It also had an effect on their marriage for the better. <laughs> so that's good. And he completely changed their life over time. Gave up his job, uh, bought a farm, became very active in his farming community, raising animals in the traditional manner, pastured and, and grass fed and so on and so forth. But it's such a beautiful book about how the simple thing of just starting with a roast chicken, and you know me, that's why I love uh, always talking about roasting a chicken. So simple, something so simple as just starting with a roast chicken. And if you're new to traditional foods, if you're new to nourishing traditions, I think starting with a roast chicken and then making roast chicken bone broth, and I have a video on how to do that and I'll link to it in the iCards, it can really snowball into having major changes in your life for the better. And Richard's book really walk, walks you through the changes that it had in his life. And it's just written so in such a heartfelt manner. I just love it. And that's why when, it, uh, when the second copy come at, came out, and I guess they, there was a little maybe professional editing done to it, I wanted to get it and read it too to make sure that it didn't change it too much because the heartfelt way in which it's written is so beautiful. And I highly recommend this. And I'll put a link in the description below. Uh, this can be a little harder to find. You may have to order this online. I can't recall having seen it at uh, a used bookstore. Uh, maybe if you have a new bookstore in your area. It has been out for a while though. But I'll definitely be sure to put a link uh, to this book below. I can't say enough good things about this or add Richard. He's just very, very inspiring. So if you don't already have nutri Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon, look for this in your travels. I think you're going to really like this book. And I just want to quickly uh, read a little bit of the uh, table of contents to you. I always like to do this whenever I uh, talk to you about a book. Uh, just to give you a little indication. But as I said, the introduction, it's 72 pages long. The, it, the introduction alone, what I learned from it, is uh, well worth the, the cost of the book. But then she goes over mastering the basics, which are really just going through bone broth, cultured dairy, ferments, sourdough, sourdough it was sourdough starter, baking with sourdough, uh, soaking grains, fermenting grains, and so on and so forth, which we discussed in a previous uh, news from my nest that uh, there are some things, this is interesting, I just want to say, there are some things that in my, in my traditional foods kitchen that I call non-negotiables. And those are things like bone broth and cultured dairy and ferments and uh, baking sourdough bread. Uh, but it's interesting that soaking and sprouting grains are one of those things that are sort of negotiables uh, if you find them very time consuming to do and to make and so on and so forth. And the reason is for some people, the soaking and sprouting uh, process may not be necessary. It has a lot to do, I'll link to that uh, video in the iCards and in the description below. That has a lot to do uh, with your genetics and how you process vitamins and minerals. So 
If you're a little overwhelmed at the thought of soaking and sprouting grains, uh, definitely research that and find out. And also, too, you can just really research it by eating the different things, the different grains in the different forms, and finding out what agrees with you. What can you digest? What makes you feel better? So much of this boils down to that. What when you make traditional foods and eat them, what agrees with you? What makes you feel better? Really just listening to your body can guide you on this traditional foods journey. So that is, is very interesting. And so sprout, uh, soaking in sprouting grains in, in my kitchen is kind of what I call a negotiable. But in any event, that's what she covers. And then she has great beginnings, the main course, uh, luncheons and suppers, grains and legumes, snacks and figure foods, desserts, beverages, feeding babies, which is always interesting, and tonics and superfoods. So it's, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful book to get you started on this nourishing traditions journey and on the journey of creating a traditional foods kitchen that I highly recommend. If you'd like to learn more about traditional cooking, be sure to subscribe to my channel and then click on this video over here where I have a playlist on mastering the basics of traditional foods cooking from bone broth to sourdough. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.